Uh, welcome to another video. Today we're going to be going through the topic of thermal physics and so here's just a few other things that we want to aim to cover today which will be the molecular model, the idea of evaporation and uh, the concept of pressure and its change dependent on the temperature and the volume. So matter is any substance that occupies physical space. Uh, so everything that you can see and everything that exists in the universe is made of matter. Um, and so matter can be arranged in different ways. And that's where the idea of the kinetic theory comes into play, where it states that matter is made of tiny particles that are in constant motion. and Again, as I said, they can be arranged in different ways. They can either be arranged very closely and tightly packed together, uh, and they still move, except it's more like a strong vibration at its fixed position. So um, those that sort of arrangement would be solids. Now, you can get to liquids where the molecules are slightly more further apart from each other, uh, to the point where the molecules themselves can sort of slide over one another but they're not completely widely spaced apart um, but they are in constant motion again and in a gas where the separation between each of the particles are very widely spread and of course they're whizzing around and moving around everywhere so in all three cases the particles are constantly moving but the main thing is the spacing is different between the particles and as a result of that then you can have different properties of these different states of matter. Uh, for example in a solid you have a fixed volume um, because you know the particles are stuck together whereas in a gas uh, there's no fixed volume as a result of its separation. So let's take a look at a few of those different uh, properties here. You've got solids, liquids and gases. Um, as you might expect solids are quite rigid as a result of their uh, tightly packed structure. Liquids are less rigid uh, and gas of course is not rigid at all. Um, but you know, liquids and gases you can say they're both not rigid obviously because um, you know the molecules are fairly widely spread. And so as a result again of the fixed structure solids have a fixed shape. Uh, liquids do not have a fixed shape. What it means is it just takes the form of the container as you can imagine pouring water in your drink bottle. You can put water in a box uh, regardless of where you put it. The liquid uh, shape will just be dependent on the container in which it's in and that's why it doesn't have any fixed shape and nor does a gas. Uh, when it comes to volume uh, again, solids have a fixed volume, liquids have a fixed volume, but gas does not have a fixed volume. Okay, so in terms of compressibility, uh, solids and liquids cannot be compressed, whereas gases, as a result of the fact that their particles are so widely spread apart, they've got a little bit more room to be compressed, um, so that's one other key difference there. So let's talk about the, the the concept of temperature. Now temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles within a substance. So you need to think about that very carefully. Um, in a substance you're going to have many many different particles that exist within the substance. Now not all of those particles are going to have exactly the same kinetic energy. Uh, some will be faster than others and some will be much much slower But ultimately when you take the average of all of the kinetic energies of all of the particles inside that substance Then that is what temperature is. So when you're heating your water from 50 degrees to 100 degrees uh, you're raising the average temperature of the particles or the average kinetic energy of the particles within that substance But by no means does that mean that every particle in the substance have the same kinetic energy. Okay, so heating causes particles inside a substance to move quicker uh, because when you heat a substance then that gives energy to the particles in that substance. When the particles within the substance gain energy then that's converted into kinetic energy and remember when we looked at the idea of the kinetic theory of um, matter particles are always moving, okay, but uh, ultimately they move qu quicker when you heat it. Uh, so therefore, um, 
that's the idea of increasing the temperature of a substance and so as you heat something or as you remove energy you can actually change the matter uh, or the state of matter of a particular substance and that sort of makes sense so if you've got some solid uh, where you've got the particles that are very uh, close together as you give energy as you add energy what that's going to do is give all these molecules increased kinetic energy so initially they sort of vibrate on the spot but as you give it more energy and more energy the vibrations are going to get stronger and stronger and stronger eventually the kinetic energies of the molecules will become strong enough to start to overcome the attractive forces between the molecules or the particles i should say themselves and as a result of that then the particles are start to gonna spread apart from each other a little bit more as a result of their increased kinetic energies that overcome the attractive forces between the particles and when it becomes spaced out enough then you've successfully trans uh, transform a solid into a liquid and the concept is exactly the same as you continuously heat a liquid the particles are start to gonna gain more kinetic energy and they're gonna start to become more separated from each other to the point where the separation gets big enough for them to be a gas now of course as you start to remove energy then they start to lose kinetic energy um, and so they start to a gas could form a liquid and a liquid could form a solid as you start to compress the particles together and that's exactly what happens when you freeze water uh, inside a freezer so going back in the concept of the average kinetic energy of particles which is again temperature um, let me just take you to the whiteboard So I want you to think of a box that contains one molecule that let's just say has 100 let's just say um, joules of energy kinetic energy or whatever and you've got another particle uh, that's moving a little bit slower at 50 joules and you've got one more particle, let's just say, right here, that's uh, at zero joules. Okay, that obviously doesn't necessarily make sense because, you know, um, every particle should have some sort of energy, but, you know, just for the sake of it. Now, what would the average temp what what's the temperature of this substance, just for example's sake? The temperature is 100 plus 50 plus zero divided by two. Okay, because you're looking at the average kinetic energies of the molecules, right? So you've got this one, you've got this one, you've got this one, and you if you take the average of the energies, then you'll be left with 75 joules, which is actually uh, the, the temperature, right? Um, and, you know, looking at it this way is very important because when we look at things like evaporation, you'll start to understand why evaporation leads to a decrease in temperature of the substance. Um, and we'll be looking at that uh, in a short moment here. Uh, but before that, let's take a look at Brownian motion. It's basically the idea that uh, when you suspend a object in liquid or fluid, then you're going to start to find that those molecules that you suspended in the liquid, uh, you're going to see that uh, they move in a very random fashion. So, for example, if you've got some, you know, if you've got a container with water, okay, and then you put in a pollen. on top of the water you let it float and you look at it under a microscope then this is the sort of motion you're going to find the pollen is going to be moving in random directions okay even though you know there's absolutely no wind or anything that's uh, you know causing the water to move uh, the reason why the pollen particle or anything that's suspended in the fluid um, goes through this type of random movement is because the water molecules inside the water they're always moving at constant random motion because again um, when you look at the kinetic theory of matter matter or particles are always in constant motion and what happens is these water molecules keep bombarding this pollen in random directions and causes it to 
travel in a random direction as well, which you can see under a microscope if you look at the polar very carefully in a very still water, causing it to you know go in random motion like this, and that motion is called Brownian motion. Okay, so when we take a look at the pressure of a gas, um, the pressure of a gas is defined as a change in momentum of the particles that strikes the wall of the, con of the container and that leads to uh, it exerting force. So if you think about a gas inside a container, uh, let's call this gas A. Well, gas A is going to be moving in random directions and you know, random uh, motion and it will continuously hit against the wall of the container. When it hits against the wall, it'll be rebounded off, but when it does hit the wall, then you've got some sort of force that um, gets exerted onto the container wall, right? And, you know, you've got that happening with billions of particles inside that container where the particles are just moving around, constantly hitting against the wall of the container and causing force to be applied at that particular area. And so if you look at it from a big picture perspective, you've got all these different particles that are exerting force against the wall of container, and that is exactly what the pressure of a gas is. If you have uh, low pressure, then you've got less amount of particles that are hitting against the wall per unit time. Uh, in a high pressure situation though, you've got more particles um, hitting against the walls, walls with increased force, okay? So if it's hitting the wall more frequently and it's hitting the wall with higher energy, well, that's high pressure. If it's hitting the wall less frequently and it's hitting the wall with less energy, then that's low pressure. And, you know, that makes sense. Um, so let's think about how we could increase or decrease uh, the pressure of a gas or what might affect that. Um, so a higher temperature with a fixed volume, so if you had box A and box B with the same volume, okay, obviously this looks a little bit bigger, but, you know, just assume that the volume is, let's say, 100 centimeters cubed, and the volume here is 100 centimeters cubed, so they're the same size of a container. Well, let's imagine in this first container you have three particles, whereas in this right container you have three particles, but the temperature of this side here, we're going to say is 100 degrees Celsius, and the temperature here, we're going to say it's 50 degrees Celsius. And so if you think about it from that perspective, which of these, A or B, has a higher pressure? Uh, the answer here would be A. And the reason for that is because when you have a higher temperature, what does that mean? It means the average kinetic energies of these three particles are higher on the left-hand side than the right-hand side. And what that means is the molecules, because they have higher kinetic energy on average, are actually traveling quicker. And when they travel quicker, what it means is more particles are bombarding against the walls of the container at a more frequent basis because molecules in general are traveling faster, but even when the molecules hit the walls, it's traveling at a quicker speed, so it exerts more force when it hits against the container of A than the molecules here on, in B as it hits the walls of container B. So not only are the molecules hitting the walls quicker, or more frequently, it's hitting it at a larger energy level and exerting more force. And ultimately, that's why the pressure of this box A is larger than box B. Um, and you can see how temperature plays a big role in that. Um, another way you can look at it is the, the volume can affect the, the uh, pressure as well. So if you have box A again, box B, this time the volume of this box is going to be 50, let's say centimeters cubed, and the box here is going to be, say, 100 centimeters cubed. Now the temperature this time is going to be the same at 100 degrees. So the only thing that's different is the volume here of the container. And let's just imagine again we've got three particles inside each. Now which pressure is higher, A or B? Again, the answer is going to be A. And the reason for that is when you have a smaller container with lower volume in which the gas is within, 
then due to the lower volume, the molecules again are going to be hitting the walls quicker because there's more chance of them colliding against the wall of the container when there's less space or less volume compared to a larger, bigger box where the molecules are more spaced apart, more further away from the wall, so it reduces the chance of collision against the wall of the container. And so, therefore, you know, once again, when you have a lower volume, it's more cramped up, so there's stronger and more frequent collisions against the container wall, which accounts for increased pressure. So when you take these two concepts together, in other words, with a higher temperature at constant volume, this scenario here, then you have an increase in pressure, and you have a lower volume at constant temperature, which is this example here, then you've also got a higher pressure. And when you take that into consideration, we've got the Boyle's Law that states for a fixed mass of gas at a constant temperature, the volume is inversely proportional to the applied pressure, which is this formula here. And all it means is really, at, when, you've got a, when you've got the same temperature as we've looked at in this example, then with an increased volume, you get lower pressures. With a decreased volume, you get a higher pressure. Um, and that will depend, you know, and how that happens will be dependent on the constant for that particular gas. But ultimately, uh, all gases will demonstrate that exact pattern. Um, so I want to take a look at uh, evaporation as we've uh, discussed that uh, very briefly before. But evaporation is the change from liquid to gas. Um, but the important thing here is it occurs below the boiling point. So we know that uh, when a liquid becomes a gas, that transition is called boiling. And you know what what happens is that when you heat a liquid enough then the particles are start to gonna separate out a lot more and eventually they separate out so much that uh, you know it, it turns into a gas and that happens at a certain boiling point okay so for example it's at 100 degrees for water where the particles start to separate out enough for it to turn into a gas or vapor um, but Interestingly enough, that's not the only way that a liquid can form a gas. Uh, in fact, it can form below the boiling point, and when that happens, we call it evaporation. And so how does that happen? As I said before, in a substance, uh, we'll take liquid here. Imagine that these red particles are water. Uh, you've got many, many different particles that make up that substance. Not all of those particles will have the same energy levels. Some will be traveling quite quicker, some will be traveling much slower. But ultimately, the average kinetic energy of those particles is what temperature is. And uh, we talked about that uh, very uh, in depth before. Um, now, because not all particles have the same energy levels, the more rapidly moving, higher energy particles that exist at the surface of the substance may sometimes have enough energy to overcome the attractive forces that it has with other particles. So in reality, most of the time the particles stick together because the particles are attracted amongst themselves. Okay, There's a certain level of energy that attracts one particle to another. But the very energetic particles within, within a substance can actually overcome those attractive forces and perhaps even escape the liquid body. So these ones here are the ones that are escaping the liquid body because they have enough energy to overcome the attractive forces between it and other neighboring particles. So these particles here have successfully become a gas. They're not liquid anymore. They've escaped as a gas. And so that is evaporation, where you have these more energetic particles on the surface of the liquid, sometimes overcoming the bonds and escaping as a gas. The key here is that the most energetic particles are the only ones that have enough energy to do this. You have to have a lot of energy to overcome these bonds, so therefore the ones that do escape are the ones that have the most kinetic energy. So given that the average of the entire block of substance, average kinetic energies of the particles there, is what temperature is. If you get the most energetic ones leaving the fluid as a result of evaporation, what do you think will happen to the average kinetic energy? 
Well, the average kinetic energy is going to go downwards, the result of the most high energy ones leaving the fluid. So when that happens, obviously, by definition, the temperature goes down as well. And so what that means is evaporation leads to a lowered temperature. And that's why when humans sweat, the whole purpose of sweat is so that the sweat can evaporate. And as the sweat evaporates, it cools our skin down. So that hopefully that makes sense. And some factors that you might find that increase the rate of evaporation is having a higher temperature, having a larger surface area so that you've got more potential particles on the surface that can leave, and increased flow of air over the surface liquid uh, just to help with the concentration gradient. So I hope you found that useful, guys. And um, if you are interested in some free notes, then feel free to go to freeexamacademy.com. That's where I put uh, all my notes for, you know, the, for making these videos. And you've got uh, my Patreon channel, which already has a lot of uh, past paper content for IGCSC Biology, Physics, uh, MCQ for Physics. Um, haven't gotten around to doing Paper 4 questions for physics just yet, but it will be coming at some time within the next few months, so look out for that. But uh, for those of you that are taking IGCSE Biology or Chemistry, I think you'll find it quite useful with the amount of resources that I have already on the platform there. Otherwise, um, I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much.